There are many reasons for I. F. Stone to be considered important, but one of the basic ones is that he's just a wonderful troublemaker, and there are very few in the world of journalism. And he loved to go after the bad guys, and that could be everybody from the top down. Look, I believe very deeply in freedom of the press and the role of the press in a free society, and I have ever since I was a kid. And you can't fulfill your function unless you're free. And、uh, I've been a radical liberal all my life, and I worked for liberal and radical papers. And then, when the last one closed in uh, in uh, in the fall of '52, which one was that? That was the New York Daily Compass. And I wanted to carry on the fight against the witch hunt and against repression, and for peace in the world.、Uh, and the only way I had was to start a little tiny paper of my own. And、uh, I'd rather write. I'd rather search for the truth and write it as I see it、uh, for a few people than write things I only half believe or half agree with for a million people. I. F. Stone was so ahead of the pack all his entire life. From the time he was 23, he was writing about Hitler when no one else was warning the world about Hitler. He covered the civil rights movement. He brought a black judge to the press club, and they wouldn't serve them, and so he, so he quit. He、uh, handled all of the the whole period of the CIA and what they were doing, the COINTELPRO, the assassinations that the CIA was behind. He was just at The very center of every pivotal part of American history in the 20th century. There's an old canard. It's a, a, a cliche you always hear from mainstream media, which I think is an apology, often for their gullibility and inaccuracy. Which is journalism is just the first rough draft of history. Izzy was debunking the fictions coming out of government as soon as they came out. He did that during World War II. When he exposed the U.S. corporations that were profiting from war,、uh, from trade with Hitler, he did it during the McCarthy era, way before Edward R. Murrow at CBS News took on Joe McCarthy. He did it week after week around the Vietnam War. We're faced with with with、uh, a whole、uh, network of interlocking problems: the problem of the black and the Chicanos, and the problem of urban blight, and the problem of pollution, and the problem of, of Of satisfactory education, these all interlock, and you just waste your money. If you put a million bucks in in here and a, on, say, a head start, a million bucks in doing a little bit here, you've got to attack it in a big way. And certainly, if we had the kind of leadership that would establish a ten-year plan and、uh, take fifty billion dollars out of the military budget, and、uh, certainly twenty, thirty billion is is enough. Over way over enough, but fifty billion dollars spent a ten-year program uh, uh, to deal with all these interlocking problems. We could build a wonderful country. We could solve these terrible racial difficulties. We could end pollution. We could build a great America. Robert Kaiser, the managing editor of the Washington Post, once said he knew history and he used it. He had the genius of reducing things to elemental. Aspects, speaking in epigrams, which would capture people's minds. For example, when he famously said, "All governments lie," a formulation that、uh, people could understand and accept. Stone was kind of like Toto, you know. It was like his job was to pull back the curtain and to see what was behind that curtain. And what was behind that curtain? Yes, it was the all-powerful Oz, but it was also just a frightened little man. Nothing, and nothing that any of us need to be frightened of. And why are why are we frightened? Of that, I think that's the whole, that's that's the embodiment of what he and his weekly stood for, and it certainly was a huge、uh, inspiration to me. His great line, of course, was, "You have to preserve your, you have to wear a, a chastity belt to preserve your journalistic integrity, because once the Secretary of State asks you to lunch, you're sunk." And that was basically the whole point. Washington is filled with access people. Not Izzy. He found his scoops, and he was utterly courageous. And he also had this brilliant mind, coupled with one-liners. He was able to say things like.、Um, When he was talking about Teddy White, who was the historian who always wrote these 
fawning books about presidential candidates and campaigns, and he'd say, and Teddy White, a man who can be so admiring need never lunch alone. <laughs> he really didn't care at all about the extent to which he was accepted in the corridors of power or in inside Washington culture. In fact, it seems as though he viewed his exclusion from those circles as not a badge of honor, but really just the minimal requirement or, or evidence that someone was actually doing their job as a journalist. And I think he viewed his role first and foremost as the way the founders viewed what journalism would be about when they protected it in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which was as a genuine check on those who wield the greatest power to prevent them from lying, to prevent them from misleading the public, and that the role of the truly independent journalists is to investigate claims of those who wield power and to find what the actual truth is and to fearlessly inform the public about what it is that they ought to know. The mailman was probably the only person in the neighborhood who was on to me when I was a teenager. <laughs> because one day he said to me, you're the only person that subscribes to Ramparts, whatever that is. You're the only one who gets this village voice and you're the only one on my route that, what is this? I have Stones Weekly. I said, yeah, well, I, I'm just trying to educate myself. You know, I'm, I'm just a kid. I'm like 16, you know, years old, so I'm, I can't, well, how come I don't know this stuff? Why am I reading this here in this little folded up newsletter thing? Um, but it was a real inspiration to me um, and, and led to me just a few years uh, out of high school of starting my own alternative underground uh, newspaper in Flint, Michigan. Izzy was never called up before the House Un-American Activities Committee. His line was, you know, what, what are they going to get on me? I'm writing and, th and saying everything I think. And so he was always flip about it. But the constant surveillance of him if you went to visit him, your license plates would be written down. That constant wearing down of the family when the kids were young, it was not a happy time. I mean, he would walk into places and everybody would sort of shun him. You know, he started the weekly because he couldn't get a job anywhere. Uh, it, at, all of the leftist newspapers had folded because of the McCarthy scare and um, he had no place to go. And he said he finally got tired of flipping rubber bands just sitting there. No one was calling him. No one was asking for his advice. No one was speaking to him. So that's when he went home and said, I'm going to start this mom and pop with Esther. So look, the market's very small. I'll try to fit the product to the market and uh, make it pay for itself by putting on a very small scale and doing all the work myself. My wife and I did all the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I managed to get 5,300 subscribers to start with. And I budgeted that very carefully so I didn't have to run around panhandling uh, to keep going, and I managed. I wanted a radical paper in a conservative format. I wanted uh, dignified topography. I didn't want screaming, sensational headlines. I didn't want exaggeration. I didn't want to pretend I had inside information when I didn't. I wanted it to be sober and factual, uh, as accurate as I could make it, uh, reasoned, not hysterical, so that people on the other side would have to take it seriously, persuasive. And uh, I tried to, to uh, prove what I was uh, saying from the horse's mouth, as it were, using the government's own documents and uh, government reports and uh, transcripts and press conferences and speeches and analyzing them the way, uh, the way a historian would. Albert Einstein was a reader of the Weekly. My father received a $5 check from him for the Weekly. He called the secretary, Albert Einstein, and said, would it be all right if I kept the check rather than with the signature, rather than depositing it? And the woman said something very interesting. She said, you know, we would rather, if you would deposit the check, we'll send you back the canceled check. The problem is that no one wants to cancel his checks and he can't balance his checkbook. Where his compassion came in was in his writing about people and situations. I mean, he has a brilliant line about the attitude of the top people in the Pentagon and others toward 
killing. And he said, um, they look as if they're looking at a dance through plate glass windows. They can see the movements, but they cannot hear the music. He had this lyrical way, and then he went into how uh, they don't understand how people will go to war, leave their family and everything to fight an oppressor, which we were, of course, in Vietnam. I wanted to, uh, to support people that were being harassed and uh, destroyed by the witch hunt. Mm. I wanted to defend what I considered uh, uh, basic American principles, and that is the, uh, the right of freedom of speech and p free political activity. The uh, basic premise of a free society is that uh, none of us can be sure of the truth, and none of us can uh, ever be sure of the whole truth, and therefore it's worth listening to uh, others. And uh, Unless you're willing to have people tell lies or half lies, you shut off truths. There's no way of policing it. There has to be freedom. There's no halfway house. And that was the philosophy of, of Jefferson of the First Amendment. A lot of journalism students are taught about the muckrakers. Ida Tarbell, Lincoln Steffens, Upton Sinclair. You know, they had independent magazines until the Rockefeller, you know, until some of the financiers bought them up to put the muckrakers out of business. Those pioneers in investigative and long-form journalism are re really worshipped by your better journalism students today. And I asked my students, who's Upton Sinclair today? Who's going into factories where workers are being oppressed and exploited? We were all what... Um Teddy Roosevelt uh, stigmatized as uh, muckrake journalists. A dreadful phrase he got out of Bunyan, I believe, and that he applied to that wonderful uh, group of American journalists before the First World War who exposed the trusts and fought for labor unionism and are very socially conscious. The newspaper men who felt an obligation to fight for the underprivileged and against injustice and against the arrogance of great wealth and concentrated economic power. So we were products of the same, the same trend. I guess it goes back to Tom Paine and the American Revolution. My father did a lot of reading and research. He kept voluminous files. And uh, because he couldn't see very well and he couldn't hear very well, he was forced to look closely at the record. And he became very good at uh, what he would call the significant trifle, something small but very revealing. He was going into the public record and trying to find details that were either buried away by those in power, trying to keep them secret, or they were hidden in the sort of endless uh, walls built by the bureaucracy. And so, you know, for instance, exposing uh, parts of the Gulf of Tonkin scandal. He didn't have to file a Freedom of Information Act request. He didn't have to go and, and, and find a, a deep throat. He went into publicly available documents and was able to obtain and bring to light information that the public had, had not been made aware of before that. There are a lot of stories in the congressional record if you take the trouble to read it. Very few people do. If you put it together with other things that he found in newspapers, which he was constantly ripping up and filing, uh, you can deduce a lot. He used to uh, sit in the back of the bus where he'd have plenty of elbow room on the big back seat and rip up the Washington Post for filing. And uh, he famously once said, uh, it's very exciting reading the Washington Post. You never know on which page you'll find a page one story. I thought it might be a good idea if I could meet with I.F. Stone. It was just an amazing, afternoon that I got to have with him to really kind of pick his brain and, and tell him, you know, what I wanted to do. And, and he gave me, you know, good advice, advice I kind of already knew because I'd read him, you know, his, his, his great motto of all governments are run by liars and nothing they say should be believed. And he said, he said to me, but, but I've ex I would expand that now to governments, corporations, <laughs> you know, it's not just the, uh, the government, it's, it's, it's that anybody in power. You must start as a journalist with the assumption that they are lying to you. And of course, what is most of journalism? Most of journalism starts with the assumption that, that <laughs> uh, 
yes, I understand, Mr. Press Secretary, yes. You know, <laughs> of course, and they just write this stuff down like it's fact. Michael Moore, a filmmaker who grew up in Flint, takes us back to his hometown. Where are you guys going? Oh, we're going up to the 14th floor. Do you have an appointment? Uh, no, we're going to try and see Roger Smith. No, you're not. Roger and me, the story of one man's search for the truth. One of the things I learned reading uh, his weekly is that humor isn't just about telling jokes or just about funny haha. Humor can be the most piercing of political weapons. Um, it, it, it just, it can be such a, I'm, I'm stunned that more people actually don't use humor because it's so powerful. And one of the great things that you learn about humor and good ridicule when in politics is that it's very hard to respond to it. You know, if, 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 if I'm laughing at you, it's very hard for you to defend or respond in any way because I and others are just laughing at what you're saying. If you say that Adam and Eve rode on dinosaurs 6,000 years ago, there isn't even a debate, there's just laughter. And, and then you can't respond to that. I of Stone was an equal opportunity deflator. He had written this brilliant lyrical book about underground Palestine when he went with, he was the first reporter to go with any of the um, Holocaust survivors running through the British blockade and everything, a very brave kind of thing. It reads like a Graham Greene novel. He was very much for the idea of this new Zionist state and then when he started realizing what, what he saw as this terrible occupying of the, of the Palestinians, he wrote about it and about uh, freedom for the Palestinians and not to treat them the way that they had been treated in Germany. And he was shunned. They no longer wanted him to speak in synagogues. He was totally ostracized by the Jewish left. I was reading some remarks um that I have Stone made um, er, very early on when you know Israel was was created, and you know he was talking about the treatment of Arabs and the treatment of the Palestinian people, and basically said if we don't stop this, if we don't stop becoming the aggressor that we wanted to stand up against, we're going to pay a very serious price for this later in life. And what I have Stone was talking about is that if you dehumanize people and you strip them of their rights, and particularly if you do that in, in the name of defending your own rights, you're gonna pay a price for it later. I've seen that same reality on the ground in Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq. A classic example of I.F. Stone's ability to ferret out something when no one else was doing it was the Gulf of Tonkin excuse for going into Vietnam. Three weeks after the so-called attack by the North Vietnamese, Izzy read all the after reports, and he said, where, where is the debris? If we had been hit, why isn't there more being talked about an actual incident where a ship had been touched by them? And he said there were all kinds of excuses why this little tiny country would go against the largest fleet in the world, except the fact that it might have been provoked. And he underlined that it might have been provoked. Of course, which was true. And he also raised this question at a time when all of the media was just following it right into war, as was Congress. And I keep thinking if the mainstream media had followed Izzy, uh, we might not have had that 10-year disaster. I'm proud to be in Berkeley, where for the first time in years, students cared enough for free speech to fight about it. As the anti-war movement grew, his following grew, and he was asked to speak to 500,000 people, 250,000 people. He was, a, again, a hero, and he uh, ended up with 70,000 subscription. Now that may not sound a lot to somebody who's on the internet today, but he was getting five dollars, it never raised the price, five dollars a year. If you add five times 70,000, you got three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And they were just doing this mom and pop thing. He had very little overhead and he always joked that he was a war profiteer because he made his money off of Vietnam. <laughs> Daniel Ellsberg told me when he was running around with his satchel full of what became the Pentagon Papers, he was on the hill and he couldn't get any 
uh, senators known they were all chicken about trying to present it. And so he found Izzy all alone in the staff cafeteria of the Senate and Ellsberg had this big pile of papers and he started explaining what he had and he was looking for guidance from Izzy and probably hoping that Izzy would would use it and Izzy was talking to him about which senators they might be able to go to neither McGovern didn't want it no one wanted it and he said you know this need and in in his mind while Izzy just was very very struck by the whole thing he didn't say I want it I'm going to grab it this bulldog Ten tendency that he had just wasn't there. And so I said, well, to Ellsberg, what do you think? And he said, I really just think he felt that it was had to go to a higher audience. And then he helped him with getting it to the New York Times. But when he got up to leave Ellsberg, Izzy burst into tears, hugged him and said, congratulations on what you're doing. It's so great. He was so thrilled that Ellsberg was doing this. And it was really from the heart. Izzy had a huge following of a certain generation. Cy Hirsch, who broke Abu Ghraib and who broke uh, Milai, and Carl Bernstein of the Watergate fame, they adored and revered Izzy, and they were, you know, hands-on, knowledgeable people who knew him. Today, you have a whole new collection who did not know Izzy but are following in his path. The FAA has taken the action to close all of the airports in the United States. Thousands of travelers were stranded, among them Ricky Martin, due to appear at tonight's Latin Grammy Awards. Not even Ricky Martin could fly. But really, who wanted to fly? No one, except the Bin Ladens. had some airplanes authorized at the highest levels of our government to fly to pick up Osama bin Laden's family members and others from Saudi Arabia and transport them out of this country. That whole idea of how I found that uh, uh, thing on, on bin Laden and the, and the, the FBI and the Bush administration allowing the bin Ladens to fly out the day after 9-11, that is directly from Eye of Stone. He said to me, he said, when you pick up the paper, you go to page 17 first. Don't read the front page. Skip the front page. Go to page 17 because that's where the truth is. And it's going to be really small. It might be in a little two-paragraph story, or it'll be buried in paragraph 78. Uh, but that's where they're putting it, and they know what they're doing. You just go right there. And I, and I just, I thought, and I can't tell you how many times that happened. And when I started doing my weekly, it actually, it became not a difficult thing to do, because really all you have to do is know how to turn the page of the paper. <laughs> and that, and not have not have whatever ADD is whatever you some people may have today. You just go right down to it, and I'm following it along, and I'm going, oh, I can't believe this. I teach my students every semester that the bad news for journalism students is that the big media conglomerates aren't doing much hiring today. The good news for journalism students is the big media conglomerates are not doing much hiring lately. And it, the idea being that independent-minded students can go out and start their own, they can work for nonprofits, they can work for some of these new and growing and hiring uh, independent outlets. This is a golden era for independent journalism. On Twitter, which is essentially the meeting place for journalists and political figures and you know, hundreds of millions of people from around the world, probably, I, if not the most influential online venue, one of the top three, there are countless people who have never stepped foot into a large media outlet or corporation in their lives who have tens of thousands of followers or hundreds of thousands of followers that they can speak to at any moment and provide information to simply because they've been able, with pure independence, to build up a platform where people want to hear what they have to say. And they say it without any constraints, without any institutional limitations. And that, to me, is really encouraging. Glenn Greenwald is going to inspire the next Glenn Greenwald. Uh, it, this is going to continue because I think as human beings, first of all, we have a desire and a thirst for knowledge. We want to know. We're curious. We're a species that's very curious, and we want to figure this out. Um, and that will always be there. And anytime you try to tell people, you can't read this, you can't know this, 
all you've done is guarantee that the people are going to demand to know it. They're going to demand to read it. And, and they'll never really be able to stop the next version of I.F. Stone. All right, I want to hear a round of applause for Myra McPherson. On this campus and, and other campuses, journalism departments and journalism schools, people are learning about Izzy Stone. Brandeis, American, Harvard, uh, Columbia Journalism School, they're all learning about Izzy. And the, the thing about Izzy is um, not to live in the past. It's not, you don't look at Izzy for historical reasons. You look at Izzy to say, God, if he could do that during the height of the McCarthy era, if he could do that in total isolation pre-internet, then there's no excuse for us to not be able to raise holy hell uh, using independent media today. We need a, a media culture in this country that is going to hold those in power accountable regardless of which party they're affiliated with. And to me, that was one of the core principles of I.F. Stone's work. He didn't start, you know, start his, his year off saying, let's see, is there a Democrat or a Republican in office? You know, he, he would start his days off saying, how can we hold those in power accountable? And that principle, you know, government's lie, it continues to this day. In fact, I think it's, it's uh, in, in some ways, it's hidden even more because of the technology. He's come a long way since he was pretty much the original volunteer at Democracy Now! Jeremy Scahill. This designation is a tremendous honor, and I want to pledge to use this opportunity to educate uh, a new generation of young journalists about the incredibly important work of I.F. Stone and the legacy that he has left all of us and the challenge that he has left us all in a very dark time to simply be journalists. Uh, this isn't a career. This isn't a profession. Um, journalism is a way of life. Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill, you know, they're not doing journalism to, to see their name in print. They're doing journalism the way Izzy did journalism, which is to better society and to speak up for the people that don't have a voice. I see the friendly ghost of Izzy Stone hovering behind all of these people. It makes me sad to think that actually he isn't with us. And it makes me really hope that, that the next Eye of Stone or two or three or four or 400 are out there now. You might be watching this right now and thinking, you know, I can do this because you can do it. You know, you can do it, especially if you, again, do the work, do the hard work, but realize that sometimes the best stuff is right there in front of your nose and you don't even know it. Finally this evening, a brief word about the journalist and author I.F. Stone. He had a truly profound effect on the practice of journalism in America. He was 81 when he died yesterday, and from the time he first began to write in the 1920s, he generally found something useful to say. He always succeeded in prompting other people to think. Sometimes they agreed, sometimes they were outraged, but there was no avoiding a connection with Stone's intellect and passion. For many people, it's a rich experience to read or reread Stone's views on America's place in the world, on freedom, on the way government works and sometimes corrupts. Very briefly and in no small measure to remind ourselves, an observation by Stone on what he thought journalism was all about. In his words, to write the truth, to defend the weak against the strong, to fight for justice, to bring healing perspectives to bear on the terrible hates and fears of mankind, in the hope of someday bringing about a world in which men will enjoy the differences of the human garden instead of killing each other over them. If you look, you'll find much more. Thank you.